I'm very pleased that we're joined today uh, by Katerina McFarland, who served as Assistant, as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Acting Army Acquisition, Director of Acquisition for the Missile, Missile Defense Agency, among other positions and senior positions in the department. Um, what I, a couple of things I particularly appreciate about Katrina is first, uh, she's a civil servant who rose to become a political appointee, which I think uh, rising to that level on, on merit alone is always an achievement and something that deserves to be celebrated. Um, second, um, when I was on Capitol Hill, I saw all kinds of people come up to brief. Um, I saw people who would crouch in a, in a position of fear. I would see people who would um, uh, forcefully repeat their talking points and not have anything they could say beyond that. And I would see people like Katrina, who would be a relief when she came to the Hill because she didn't come to browbeat or mindless, re mindless re repeat talking points, but to engage. Uh, she would communicate, but she would also listen and learn. Um, and it was it was truly a, 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 a privilege to talk to her, to meet with her when she was coming to, to coming to brief us from the executive branch. Second, we have Arun Serafin, professional staff member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, a former IDA employee also a principal deputy, principal assistant director for national security and international affairs at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, if I have that mouthful correct. Um, and I like to say the only staff member I ever hired is, is to the Senate Armed Services Committee, and I liked him so much I did it twice. Um, but I wanna add one other thing to that, which is one of the last things that I got to do as staff director is I had to decide as I was going out the door um, who is going to take over my treasured portfolio on acquisition reform. And I decided that Arun is the smartest person in the room was the one I would trust to do that. Um, and I haven't regretted those, that decision, even as I've seen him reverse so many of my <laughs> legislation over the years. Um, thank you, Arun. Um, finally, we have Jim Woolsey, uh, president of Defense Acquisition University, former uh, Deputy Director of Performance Assessments at PARCA and former IDA st research staff member uh, who worked on any number of high profile acquisition review reviews, including on the, the uh, Joint Strike Fighter and the Tanker Lease. Um, and what I particularly appreciate, appreciate about Jim is that I know that he shares my devotion to the acquisition workforce and gets up every morning thinking about what he can do to make the acquisition workforce better. Um, and that is absolutely crit critical to everything we're talking about on this panel. Um, so the panel moderator is Dave Sparrow, an IDA research staff member, the winner of the Good Pastor Award for Excellence in Research. Um, I will just read some of his core areas of research, systems evaluation, technology assessment, S&T planning, planning and strategy, acquisition planning, resource management, logistics and business pra practices, organization and management practices, the list goes on. And what I would say on top of that is, if you really want to get depressed about how little you've accomplished in life, just read Dave Sparrow's list of publications. Over to you, Dave. So it's a, maybe a lot of publications, but I'm not sure uh, how much it'll accomplish. I, I want to take credit for, uh, there, there was a rules and uh, engagement issue, and the comments I prepared for uh, our distinguished speakers are almost the same as Peter's. So anytime I'm thinking the same along the lines Peter are, I'm feeling good about myself. Um, I wanted to tell a little story. Many of you know, some of you are deeply engaged in the fact that Ida is moving. And when I went, you know, we're cleaning out our offices. 20 years ago, I was on loan to dot and &E. When I came back, I gave a talk to the Ida staff about, you know, my two years in the Pentagon. And there was a section of the talk entitled, um, Fixing Acquisition Will Be Hard. So I looked through those charts and I discovered three points that seem not to have changed very much, which is one of the challenges, ongoing changes in OSD, one of the challenges was that, that there is opposition to any quality control effort as being inefficient. Um, and I think this may be something that the building always thinks uh, to, to go to the, the, the earlier comments. And finally, the process is changing every 18 months. So that makes the challenges enduring even while there are dramatic changes in the national security environment and, and everything else going along. I do think, uh, I'll skip the introduction, but I do wanna tell one story about Arun, not unrelated to uh, Katrina's talents. Uh, there was a uh, congressionally mandated study that um, uh, the department was late on. And by late, I mean, they didn't come to us to help execute the study until after it was due. So the penalty for this was they had to kind of have to go over and brief the staff and three 
OSD officials uh, dragged me along to go and brief, uh, I guess, mostly Senator Levin's uh, staff members uh, on this particular issue. And I'd never seen such three talented individuals so filled with terror in my life. Um, so we're going over there to brief them and everyone is concerned about the, the verbal floggings that are about to take place. So we get over there and um, Arun actually answers the door. And Arun not only worked at Ida, he worked with me at Ida. So he says hi to me. And then he looks at the three other guys and he says, wow you guys must be really important if you've got Dave Sparrow to wear a tie. <laughs> <laughs> so the half hour scheduled meeting expanded to a two hour wide ranging discussion, technical issues, uh, the future of legislative uh, engagement and constraints on the department in this area and everything else was absolutely marvelous. A set of um, uh, you know, interpersonal skills uh, that Arun has that did not show up in his, uh, in his bio. And this was, uh, this was, I thought, an absolute delight. So I'm here to say I am happy to wear a tie today <laughs> out of respect for the panelists, all of whom are extraordinary individuals, and uh, out of respect for our guests, both in the room and online. Thank you very much. I think our room's up first. Uh, well, thank you. I, that's all recorded. I will pass that on to my mother-in-law, that just <laughs> understands it how impressive I am. Um, I need to start um, by one thanking Ida uh, for, for getting me on this defense technology and research journey and, uh, and putting me on my one year fellowship to Congress, which is, I'm renewing it again for another year. So uh, that thanks Ida for its indulgence on the, on the one year assignment to the Hill. Um, the other thing I have to say as a Hill staffer is that nothing I'm going to say is the views of the Congress or Jack Reed, my boss, or the Senate Armed Services Committee or any other people I work for. Um, in fact, most of the things I'm going to say are not my views. They're probably things I stole from some of you. Uh, but this is a great room of smart people to try out ideas on. And so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about two frontiers in acquisition reform that uh, I think some staffers, including me, have our heads uh, in right now, and, and we're looking to steal ideas on how to make progress in, in these two areas. So the first I wanna talk about is a theme called, uh, we, we'll call it uh, oversight over overseers. Um, so we're in, a, we're in a, a world where we all understand that we need oversight um, of, of various forms and in various levels of detail. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it has to be there to push back on the natural tendencies of companies, government organizations, services, individuals um, to do what's the right thing very locally, but often the wrong thing on a, on a more macro level. And so no one is arguing we don't need oversight. We're just arguing that we need to tweak oversight in, in some way. Um, oversight, of course. Is, uh, is, is important uh, for going after waste, fraud, and abuse, of course. So you know, th these, things, these things do need to exist in, in some form. Um, and oversight is important because the system we're defending is based on transparency, democracy. It's not, it's not a secrecy-based society that we're, we're, we're uh, trying to defend here. And that, that transparency and that oversight by lots of eyes should be considered a strength. And we, we just need to figure out how to, how to optimize it and, and weaponize it, honestly, for, for our advantage. So, um, you know, oversight's important, but oversight unchallenged is very, very dangerous, right? Because it clearly creates systems which are risk averse, can freeze in place, slow down processes at a time where Jamie is pointing out, speed is very important. Um, we, we need to make sure we, we figure out how to optimize the oversight with the speed that's necessary and the innovations that's necessary in the system. And that's where I'm stuck now, okay? I don't know what to do after saying all those, all those things which, which are maybe obvious to everyone. Um, one thing we believe, and we've we've tried to talk to all the standard oversight bodies, and I'll just rattle off the test community, for example, and the CAPES of the world, and the GAOs, and the IGs of the world, and the Hill staff of the world, is that oversight needs to be more 
cooperative and engaged and less um, gotcha in some sense. Um, it, it needs to be done earlier in processes. So if you think about acquisition processes, one of the complaints that Paul Francis from GAO used to always have to us is that you guys pay attention too late and to the wrong things. And so we need to think up ways of how it is that oversight officials, whether they're in OSD or the Congress, can lay eyes on acquisition programs earlier on in their cycles, maybe even before they become part of the budget request, which is the natural, natural trigger for oversight, so that we can ask whatever questions we can using our independent voice or GAO's independent voice or the equivalent of DOT and E's independent voice of these programs early on as they're making the mistakes that will then haunt us for 20 or 30 years. I don't know how to do that because I don't even know when that program is first manifesting itself in someone's idea. I don't get to see what goes on in the AOAs. I don't get to see much of anything that happens before milestone A. But then I'm told it was too late. You should have been paying attention then and you should have been asking these hard questions then. Someone needs to help us think about how we do that more timely oversight. Um, and then the other part of this, especially in this era of reversing Peter's acquisition reforms with our own acquisition reforms, is we've, we've, we've tried to move to a, a place of more risk tolerance, right? Let's, let's place a lot more bets. Let's move a little faster. And no one ever bothered to tell the oversight community that we were doing this, including ourselves, right? So we give you the candy of streamline acquisition, middle tier, more use of other transactions, but we reserve the right to yell at you and beat you if you do anything wrong. There's no way to encourage innovation uh, and risk tolerance. And so we need to come up with ways to talk to my bosses and other oversight officials about how to think about what is okay failure and how to think about at least judging someone's program on the basis of they're thinking about all the right things. They look like they have a competent approach and if things don't work out, that's okay. They at least have laid out a, a reasonable strategy of how they're gonna handle the risks and challenges of this program. Um, that does require then more transparency on the part of the overseen to admit possibly, we don't actually have all the answers here, but here's what we're gonna try. This is our best effort. And with your support and some tolerance, we think we can get there. I have not seen how we can do that well. I'm happy to try to develop the pilot programs which I like personally, even if Mr. Work says there's too many, um, to try to establish a new way of doing this. And then I think the other last aspect of overs oversight that I think is neglected is oversight should also result in finding good news stories and telling people you did a good job and honoring success. And on the Hill, we do a terrible job of that. And I believe the department does a terrible job of spreading its good news stories. The department does a remarkable job of spreading its bad news stories. But on the other hand, you know, for me to find out who won the latest set of acquisition awards means I have to actually dig through the paper copy that was mailed to me in a mailbox that I rarely go to, find it and look to see who won these things. And then honestly, when we find out someone won something, senators are usually pretty happy to hear about it. And often they get a nice little note, say, congratulations on this thing you did. You know, we're proud of you kind of thing. So how is it that we can develop a system where we can actually hold up people who succeeded at things? Where some of the testimony is about, we tried these things and they worked. Thank you for that authority, or thank you for the support. That We always wanna hear that kind of thing. But we need to come up with those mechanisms of honoring success, whether they're, they're just, you know, honors and awards or money or whatever it is. But I think that's an important part of oversight that we've missed. Um, okay, so that's one, break, break. 
The other one I want to talk about is handling of money budget reform. It's all the rage right now as, as, as a, a new tenant in acquisition reform, and uh, we are for it. The, the committee, you can see in our press release, talked about establishing a commission to look at these kinds of financial rent management reform, budget reform issues, honestly, beyond just acquisition, to look more broadly at everything ranging from um, the PPB process to use of working capital funds, to colors of money, to sharing of money between public and private sector, all of the things that we'd like to do that we can't figure out because of approach rules, financial management regulations, scoring rules, all of those kinds of things. These are all good things for us to work, work on. And I think where I work, I think the members understand, especially because so many of them now are coming with private sector experience, that money in fast moving technologically uh, changing environments is handled very differently in the private sector than it is in the public sector. And they're open to hearing about these ideas. My boss, Senator Reed's fond of saying that, you know, the PPB process is the finest thing that was produced in the 1950s and 60s. And we proudly use it like an antique car, um, but maybe it's time, time to do something, something new. Um, so, the one piece of it I think I would focus on, sitting where I sit, is that I always feel like there's a period of time when, when like-minded people can work together to get things right that we just completely waste. Um, the budget locks sometime in a previous calendar year, big books are printed, stuff's posted online, and a budget's delivered to Capitol Hill on a normal year, in February. Then I and lots of other people sit through lots of things called staffer days, appropriation staffers do it, there's hearings on the Hill, all of that. And there's a process by which Congress reviews that budget request, which was locked into place many months earlier. And it takes about 10 months or so for us to produce what's the actual budget, despite what the executive branch thinks, the appropriations law, which is the actual budget of the Department of Defense. And that happens every year since I've been a child between Thanksgiving and Christmas, pretty much, almost. Um, all that time between February and Thanksgiving is wasted, in my opinion, because despite the fact that technology and threat are changing every day in that whole time, otherwise very intelligent people in the executive branch come to us on a daily basis and say, I support the president's budget. Though they know that in the building of that budget, they lost, lost lots of internal battles as to what the right allocation of resources should be. And they know that since that time, fact of life changes in technology and threat and program progress have happened all along the way. So I would argue that if we could make better use of that time on the Hill to work together to adjust the budget request so that the actual budget appropriations is as close to right as we possibly can. We've one, done a better thing for the, the capabilities we're trying to deliver. Second, we've done the right thing for the public because that day of appropriations is the day of maximum transparency to the people who actually pay the bills, as opposed to anything that goes on post appropriations, reprogramming processes, below threshold, all of that is opaque to the public. But that day of appropriations, there's something special about it. And then finally, that year of talking, in my opinion, buys you goodwill from the Hill so that when you inevitably have to make those changes and you have to go through these reprogramming processes, you've got more buy-in from the Hill to begin with. And it is, we have skin in the game. And I think we'll be more sympathetic to the changes that naturally have to happen. So again, I'd love the help to figure out how you could do that, even on a pilot basis to make better use of that time on the Hill to get the dollars right on that day of appropriations. With that, I'll stop. I'm happy to take questions at the end. I think Jim's up next was our plan. Did that work for you? Thank you. And thank you, Arun, for those comments. I was taking notes. I hope we get to get to some of those um, because there's some really interesting points there that, that I think we should uh, build on. Um, but that would get me off my brief and we don't wanna do that right now. So. Um, I want to thank IDA for putting this together and uh, it's a welcome home for me. I, I'm seeing some familiar faces from back in the day. 
Um, it was a really great part of my career to be here, and um, it's good to see everyone. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone without plexiglass and masks. Hopefully, we can do that again someday soon. But and in the meantime, it's really good to be back and be seeing people here. So um, I want to talk about uh, the future of activism reform, as we said, and that what we think we should do next. And I, I want to start by saying I think we have to decide that we have to decide what the priorities are going to be. It needs to be a small number, I would say no more than three, so that we can pay attention. I know this is true because Peter Lenin's book says so. And in the book, he quotes um, some research done at DAU. So if it's IDA and DAU together, it's got to be true. So, so we need to focus on, on what we want to do next. And I'm going to make a case for one particular part of acquisition reform and hope to get your vote, as it were. And I want to start by telling a couple of stories. Um, one story is that I was talking to a business executive who works in China, and I asked him about the things that make it hard to work in China. And I expected to talk about the restrictions on joint ventures and the 49% share and a lot of things like that. And instead, what he told me was that his biggest problem was that as soon as people in his company got good at something, they disappeared. And he didn't know for sure where they went, but he had a strong suspicion that where we went, he went was to a factory that did similar work for the military. And um, I want to contrast that with how we get people in the Department of Defense. And I note that the AI commission that uh, Mr. Work led and that Katrina was part of talks about how important it's going to be to get skills in AI. And I want us to compare how China does it to how we do it when we think about moving forward on those processes. And it's a daunting comparison. Second story, um, a friend of mine, longtime friend, Joe Dyer, he was the commander of Navair, went on to do very well at iRobot, been a friend and mentor for decades, also was in China. And um, they, when he was with iRobot, and they showed him a field where they wanted to build a factory. And he came back less than a year later, and the factory was there and about to begin operations. Um, IDA has some experience, I understand, with uh, building a building and occupying it. And I think it took more than a year, it would be my guess. And um, I just want to offer that as another point of comparison. There are more important stories than that, of course, in the technology area. Um, running the schoolhouse, I'm not intimately involved with those things today, but I know that many of you are. And I know a lot of people who are, and they're not comfortable. Um, you hear people say things like inside our OODA loop, and you don't want to hear that about a uh, near peer potential adversary. So um, all that gets to the point of my vote is going to be for speed, that speed is what we need to pay attention to. Um, sounds like I have Jamie Morin's vote or, or might be able to get it without too much trouble. I'm glad to hear that. Um, Heidi Shu talks about it a lot, and, and I think speed is really um, something we need to pay more attention um, than we have. And that means making trade-offs, it means changing policy, it means doing the big things. But I want to narrow that down to a, just one part of it, and I want to narrow it further to something I think I can actually do something about. And uh, hopefully in telling that story, I can um, point the way to doing some bigger things. And I want to narrow it down by using a term that I heard from a guy named Aaron Dignan. He's an author. Um, he's a, one of these consultant people. And I, I, I met him at a, a, a kind of conference I was involved in. And he had, I read a lot of books. I hear a lot of people and I mostly I put them aside. But he had a term that, that stuck with me and it was called organizational debt. And he said that um, we're all familiar with financial debt. You borrow too much money, whether you're a person, a company, or country, and it catches up with you and you can't do things later and it limits your choices and it bogs you down. And technical debt, you know, if you buy a lot of IT and a lot of other things. If it, so organizational debt, he says, is about the way we add things to our processes all the time. And the reason I love the metaphor so much is it has a couple of qualities that, that make sense to me. One of them is that Financial debt can be an insidious thing. It isn't one thing you bought or one decision you made. It's how they all add up until the debt becomes overwhelming, either for a person or a country or a company. And such it is with organizational debt. It isn't that that check and balance was a problem. It isn't that that new organization to take care of that thing created caused a problem, but it's the way that it all adds up. I, I really, that, that insidious quality to it is attractive to me as a way to think about it. And if we start thinking about 
the, the things we do in terms of speed. And we think about debt. Um, Mr. Work talked a lot about efficiencies in terms of money. I want to talk about that, but also efficiencies in terms of speed. And if you work in the Pentagon, you know that organizational debt uh, this guy makes some money doing consulting for companies. Organizational debt's a problem everywhere, but we're especially good at it. And um, you know the 2,000 pages in the FAR and the 1,500 in the DFAR and, and on and on and on. Um, no kidding, I recently went through, it took three weeks to get permission to start coordinating a document. It's, in a sense, it took three weeks to get approval to get approval. And this just happens every day, and it adds up to the goo that we live with every day. Okay, Jim, that sounds really nice. Thank you for that penetrating insight into the obvious. What are you going to do about it? And um, I do want to talk about what I can do in my little part of the world and, and hopefully how that might extrapolate to um, other parts of the world. So at, at DAU, what we decided to do, if we looked at all the portfolio of training that people do, and we decided to make a lot less of it required and a lot more of it optional. The organizational debt that it built up in training was over time, for lots of good reasons, people said you need to get training on that, you need to get training on another thing, you need to get training on this as well, and it just built up. And we decided one person in OSD knew what everybody in contracting needed to know, and the answer was everybody needed to know everything. Whether you're gonna be a major program contracting or a contingency contractor or um, whatever it was, you're going to learn it all. And so we had 650 hours of, of required training to get to level three in contracting. That's a lot of training. And most of it was specialized. It's, it's in these other areas that we talked about. So um, another aspect of getting rid of organized debt is giving people control so I gave it away and I had DAU work with the services to shrink it down and they overachieved. And the contracting curriculum that was 655 hours is now less than 200 required. That's a huge amount of training that's no longer required. The next step we have to do is make sure that people are able to get the training they actually need at the time they actually need it. So they'll get the training when they're about to do contingency contracting instead of in their first three years in acquisition. The result of this is DAU is big. There's 185,000 people in the workforce. This change is going to save on the order of millions of hours every year for the workforce. Then for DAU, we're going to take the resources we were spending teaching people things they didn't need to creating credentials, we call them, pa packages of learning people can get at the time they need it. So it's not just a free for all, but there's we make things available to them. You're about to go to a major defense acquisition program. Here's the credential that'll get you the things you need. We're actually created more work for ourselves because we've got to create all these credentials. Demand is already exceeding supply, but all to the good because we're creating more content of different kinds for people at the time they need it. So we've done our little part within to reduce organizational debt by taking away this required training and doing more of this optional. We also have the chance to work with organizations out there and leaders while they're uh, young and not yet set in their ways about this idea of speed and how to think about their jobs. I've changed how I think about my job. It's hard. I regress almost every day, but I'm trying to give up control and give people the power to create the things they want to create. And sometimes they mess stuff up and I have to catch spears and apologize for them and fix it. But I actually don't have to do it that often. And um, the energy that's creating within DAU has really been remarkable to see. Um, I've lost control. Stuff's happening every day. I have no idea what people are doing and it's marvelous. Um, um, but I'm an engineer. I have to fight it every day um, because control is what engineers do. Um, but I wanna start building that idea in the workforce as part of their training that um, checking for the sake of checking is not an accomplishment, that speed really does matter that getting things done quickly really can make a difference. And, and that's what I'm trying to do in, in my little part of the world. And I wanna ask everybody to also take that seriously. I mean, um, we're, in a, we're in a situation we've never been in before. And I, I know people have talked about this a lot, but what strikes me the most about the current environment is China's GDP is either equal to ours or soon will be. And there's no question it's going to be bigger. We haven't faced that situation in any of our lifetimes. You could argue not since, hundreds of years ago. 
That's a tough spot. I mean, we have to do it better. Excuse me? 1812. I was going to say 1812. Um, that's probably the last time that we had that situation. So the last time. That means we've got to do it better. And that means going faster. And when they talk about bloodshed and cracked heads, um, that doesn't sound friendly to me. So um, I, I, speed is something that we really need in order to compete in this environment. And um, that's my, I'm going to make my case for that being a point of emphasis going forward. And over back to you. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to try to wrap up this and give you some things to think about. So we've talked about relevant speed, efficient oversight, trained and valued and adequate numbers of personnel. Uh, how do we take a budget that was process-wise built many years ago and put it into today's environment? And I'm going to add requirements. And I'm going to talk about what does this mean in the world's environment as we see it today? Because uh, we're seeing a decline or a neutral budget, and that would be nice, but we also have a different type of, I'll call it war going on. Um, I had the fortune of working uh, with the Secretary of Work and many, many technocrats on this commission. And what was really interesting was it took us a year to get the commissioners who weren't part of the federal government to understand the threat to the point where they remove their assets from China. So if we don't have a public that understands the nature of what's going on in the world, how will we harness that? And this world is not in a kinetic battle and we're not positioned to know how to react to a non-kinetic battle. And that means that we have to think differently, but the good news is, is there's technologies and innovation in this country that we can leverage. Going back to 1812, if those of you who haven't watched Turn Spies or read the book on Washington Spies, you'd recognize that we have other levers to pull, that we can improve our positioning with respect to the pillars that Eisenhower talked at the end of World War II, which are economic, political, et cetera. The war is a broad context. So procurement, acquisition, this term reform that I in my own career have seen umpteen zillion times be discussed, really at this point, similar to what Secretary Work has said, can and should change. So let's talk about a tool. I think um, folks think about technology space, think about the threat informed decisions that we need to make in order to prioritize where our resources are going, um, have some familiarity and certainly an interest in the technology. It's in the world today. I'll use artificial intelligence because that was terms that uh, Secretary Work talked about briefly. I think we have the ability to make faster and more informed decisions, creating transparency to what Jim talked about, educate just in time. We went through revolution with the pandemic. How many of you worked as much virtually before the pandemic? How many of you trusted a virtual environment to work in? And see where we are today. We've created productivity and in a area where in two years ago, I would never see the activity played out. What does that mean? It means that we should recognize that our assessment of risk is imbalanced. And I'm gonna talk about three areas as an engineer to Jim and, and uh, I consider Arun an engineer, although he doesn't talk about being an engineer, his technology and his background is such that he's probably better than most of us. But I think of, I'm gonna use three areas broadly to just give you a way to think through this, but look at bi how we address biology, how we address chemistry, and how do we address material science. There's three different risk profiles, right? In biology, if three frogs do it, we consider it done, God bless, off you go, it's what frogs do, and that's the way it is. In chemistry, we wanna see something more detailed in our assessment of risk. It could be that we would see when we add the chemicals together, the color exposed. Or it could be that we would want to have a repetitive demonstration of our hypotheses 
in terms of experimentation. But once we've demonstrated it to a certain level, and usually it's about a half to a sigma of confidence for the mathematicians in this room, which there are many, we move on. But when it comes to material science, we want it to the two sigma or beyond confidence level. We need to literally map out the ones and zeros of our software. We want to have every element tested of the tensile strength of the elegons in the uh, aircraft. Those systems, biology, chemistry, and material science are now intersecting. And when you work in the S&T environment, we're seeing a bunch of freaked out people trying to work together. We should be learning from this because the new environment and the ability of us at machine speed, which with quantum is almost to the level of human, but nonlineal processing is still a human domain. We're going to have the ability to leverage that uh, uh, technology space and human capacity expansion to allow us, if we fulfill that destiny, to reform how we do the business and to be able to be current and maintain our position of freedom and stability that we so desire. So if we take a look at what that technology space can afford us, the Jim's comment of making training real time, I host it. It doesn't have a number system that limits how many people can participate in real time learning online. And I can help people find the knowledge they need by having triggers in the system through analytics to know what they're needing because of what they're doing on their computer. That isn't that far off. We do that in the financial world. How many of you have saw, spoken to your husband or your wife and said, gee, I really would like a new car and suddenly see on Facebook a car pop up? Trust me, it's being done today. We should be harnessing it to our biases, to our value system as a nature of this nation. And we can. So if we take a look at financial, to Arun's comment, we have a budgetary system that's built along a certain material science, I'll call it methodology. We have to fuss over a requirement and hopefully enough of the threat is forecasted so we can project what that should be in the future because it's gonna be the future before we get the money, right? Write a requirement, two years, budget for it, two years, contract for it, two years. Oops, in this world, especially the commercial world, we are way past what that requirement as written needs or can do. So let's compress that timeline. Let's use data tying the threat to SNTI, science and technology and intelligence, to forecasting, predicting what we might need, helping us write requirements real time and oh, adjust them. The system can afford that with transparency. If Congress knew objectively what we wanted to achieve and could see what the information flow is that's going on in the department that's allowing for changes in the decision making, oops, the threat, or oh, the technology opportunity space is just as important as defensive and offensive posture. Opportunity gives you overmatch, would be nice to be able to leverage that. I used to say if somebody would write me a, um, a capability that they could demonstrate, they would have anti-gravity for me, uh, any gravity paint for me, I couldn't buy it because I didn't have a requirement and they didn't budget. Wouldn't it be awesome if I could say my threat affects based outcomes, I would like to be able to take out a grid square or float a uh, ship in the air. I could have a general outcome that I could meet with a near term real time capability. So let's think about those things that we have in front of us that we would want to do. Risk. Opportunity space, technology, human space, education. The numbers of people that are out there they could contribute if they felt they could have real hands-on opportunity space and that can conclude with industry innovation, having visibility to be able to comb our own assets and understand what we have available to us and where that is trending real time for decision makers is not fantasical. We have ability to do that and we should leverage it. So how do we take that ownership? We create incentives 
we build out, we build out confidence by starting small, gaining, putting momentum into areas of higher import and keep demonstrating that while we reduce the layers of inefficient oversight, because I can actually, we demonstrated it when um, the Obama administration was in place, we actually had um, a automated, certainly not with the levels of advanced technology right now, but we had an automated decision-making process where everybody would be sent the documents at the same time, given a very specific time to be able to make comment. And at the end of that, the decision was moved forward on. It cut 120 days out of just one set of decision-making processes. Why can't we do that today? We can, we just have to do it kind of like the Nike advertisement. So the, I'm gonna stop because I think every one of you have more to offer and questions that we could leverage, but I am very heavily engaged in uh, the ability to look at intelligence information as a contributor to requirements generation and advances in acquisition execution. I think that the budget could be as informed and it could be allowing us to do things more rigorously, but yet quicker. And I think the training avenues that we should have an education renaissance for are right in front of us. We just literally have to move. The good news is, is Congress has made quite a substantial investment into trying to improve this. And I'm very heartened that the people, because we are the best of all countries, we have no specific design, we are a combination of all that intellect, when leveraged in the past has definitely demonstrated that we can lead and can continue to lead, and we should lead. But the world isn't as we think of it, it is what it is, and it has more people than we have, and we have to position ourselves quickly and informed, but quickly. So. So let me let me use this opportunity to take the first question, which will be for anyone who wants to answer it. Uh, the whole morning, but particularly these panels, has been swirling around these issues of speed and risk tolerance. Um, and the first thing I want to do is make a distinction, because talking about uh, risk tolerance from a technology point of view, that it's done very, very differently in biology, chemistry, and material science. But there's also a bureaucratic comment to this con component to this um, risk tolerance, which is worth breaking out and is more related to the processes of the department than the actual material developments. I would argue that the risk tolerance, the risk intolerance of the department is actually more bureaucratic than technical. Um, the department is often willing to take horrendous technical risks not always at the um, component level, but certainly at the system and program level, uh, if it mitigates bureaucratic risks. So I want to I want to tie this risk tolerance and and the desire for speed back together. I think the the risk tolerance uh, the risk tolerance in technology costs you time because you launch programs that are ill conceived. The risk intolerance bureaucratically costs you time because you set up process after process after process to prevent mistakes, not, not to present mistakes from happening, but to prevent mistakes from happening that you can get blamed for. Um, and so, so what I would like to do is to see if the panel members have thoughts about, about you know, is there, are there things that can be done at the nexus of these things? Is this a worthwhile distinction between uh, our different tolerance for a technical and bureaucratic risk? I guess I would say um, that Congress can help with bureaucratic risk. We can provide waivers to laws and regulations um, as needed to sort of mitigate your, your perception of that bureaucratic risk. Uh, again, if there's sharing of data, transparency, requests for that kind of uh, waiver, and that's that's kind of what OTs are. It's, you know, every, every this what personnel uh, flexibilities are. All of those kinds of things. On the other hand, despite the many requests, I've never been able to provide a waiver to the laws of physics. Um, so, you know, that 
that kind of risk, you know, that that's, we can't help. And that's where we are going to come down and say, how could you be so stupid, right? Um, so I think that hits perfectly, right? My tool set, as we say sometimes, is I fix the law, right? It's just a shared word processing document in my world. So, okay, do you need, do you need something changed? We can do that. So I completely agree that we need to sort of think about and where we're afraid of this. I'd like to build on the word distinction. I, I think one of the problems we have is distinguishing big risks from small ones and treating them all like they're big ones. Um, I could do the things I did because the risk going wrong is, of course, is lousy. In the big scheme of things, that's not going to really cause a lot of, um, of problems. But it's amazing how hard that it, even a simple thing like that is to do because everyone treats small risks like they were aircraft carriers. And um, I think we still have a lot of work to do as an organization at, and as individuals to think about what the risks are. Um, I think it was Pete Medigliani did put something on LinkedIn the other day, some questions. And he said, we should ask ourselves before we put a check or a process in place, what happens bad if, there, if there's no check? What is the bad thing? What would a bad thing been if I had gotten my document into coordination three weeks faster? I, I, you know, nothing. Um, and we treat all risks the same. And I think that's a, a real danger. And I want to be clear that um, I'm an engineer and I worked at IDA and I understand checking and oversight and how important it is. That's a good. I want to torture the metaphor about financial risk. Um, the problem with getting financial debt and credit cards is you separate the good from the cost, right? I want the bobble and the cost will come later. I don't think when we put our checks and balances in place and add them, we don't think about the costs in the big picture about what they add to the goo. And if we would differentiate and think about costs as well as benefits, we could make progress. And it's going to be a culture thing. There's going to be big processes, but it, and it's going to take a long time. I've, it's hard enough for me to get DAU's culture to change. It's been um, gratifying and, and great, but it's, it's hard to do. But we've all been built in this risk averse culture, all of us. That person wanted to make sure that the document was in the right font before it went into community coordination, and that was his job. Um, and that's what he cared about because that's how we taught him. And it's going to take a long time to get that goo out, but it really adds up. And so differentiating and looking at costs as well as goods. Well, there's so much meat there. Uh, so to me, I like that cons uh, conversation of distinction, and I'm going to add incentives to distinction. We don't necessarily have the right incentive structure to create an understanding what risk is important and what risk isn't important. We're very good, well, at least above average in doing contracts in incentives, or at least having a dialogue about incentives. But we have an organizational incentive structure that we should be working on. And the incentive shouldn't be, well, if I take away more people, they'll have to focus on what's important. One of the problems I have is, is that if people think because the organization is large, trimming it back will reduce the amount of stepping stones. And frankly, that isn't correct. One of the biggest challenges I had uh, in the positions that I held was having time to think. That's why I personally get excited about artificial intelligence, because I can feed it all the math that I'm trying to struggle with and do the data collection and give me information so I can get faster about my decision making process for thinking. But incentives are a huge player in this whole thing about risks at the lower level and at the top level. And if I see nothing but a mountain of people above me are going to make decisions, what incentive do I have to put in front of them an information or a decision that is clear cut? And I'll give you a little anecdote. When I was about a GS-9, I had to write a letter that I knew that at that time working for the Marine Corps, the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps was going to see. So I drafted the letter and I had a lot of advice from the chief warrant officer sitting next to me. He said, make sure you have some mistakes in this. And I said, why? And he said, well, that gives them the chance to feel powerful so that they'll move it along quicker because they made correction and they'll feel valuable. Hmm. What was also interesting, as I did as said, and I had my original letter that I wrote, and when it finally came back a couple months later, it was my original letter. So I think this issue of incentives has to be explored. 
And how do you create incentives that allow people time and positions are important, but what is important to the second question is also of interest to me. And let me bring you another anecdote. We have wonderful tools in our toolbox, both kinetic and non-kinetic, but I'll use a kinetic because it's easier to understand. We have wonderful missile systems. They can do a lot. But if you can't launch them because you don't have command and control and you don't have communication, what good are they? And yet the investment being small in command and control until recently when we had the real face of a peer, et cetera, and we started to focus on it. But do you see the momentum and the energy behind it? No. And a little voice came up to me one day when I was challenged for the fifth time in my career to try to do a joint command and control system. Well, Katrina, the problem is the guy in command doesn't want to fire on somebody else's data because he'll get held accountable and blamed. Until we remove that, like we do with industry when we indemnify them when they build a missile system, you're not going to get a whole bunch of people running to the table to get that joint command and control capability to network systems to make them more efficient or effective. Incentives. I would encourage um, questions from the audience. I've had a week to think of questions. And you're going to get crappy questions from me if you guys don't step up. So please, sir. So I, I got a question that's sort of listening and coming from a room. As somebody who spent his whole career working at MFRDCs or places that used to be MFRDCs, so I ran, I know. Um, if you wanted more cooperative, cooperation and engagement between the Congress and the Department of Defense, and particularly in acquisition, you have a resource, the FFRDC community, which isn't in it for the money. And they're in a position to speak truth to power on both sides, both to the Congress and to the Department of Defense. And I've never understood why they're not more heavily used to improve the dialogue, maybe you're having the FFRDC people over. They have to, the FFRDC people have to talk to make sure they're not going to say something which the DOD really doesn't want them to say. But, you know, FFRDC is might be a way to formalize some sort of line of communication between the department and the Congress and the congressional staffs where you're going to get new thinking, new ideas, questions, which will help you to get the kind of engagement and cooperation you're talking about. What do you think of that idea? Sure. I mean, I think uh, intermediaries of any form, whether they're formerly FFRDCs or other trusted uh, agents, you know, in the nonprofit think tank world, LMI, as opposed to IDA, right, whatever. Uh, of course, right? If someone can create those shared spaces where people who are working on the same problems as me, but happen to have a different badge this year, can sit together and talk and trade ideas. And then there's a smart person who understands what everyone's saying and can turn it into something actionable for both sides of the table. I think that's great. I think the other thing that maybe you're getting to also, which if not, I'll just say it, is that we need more people who, who go back and forth between both sides to the FFRDC side, to the executive branch side, and then back over to the legislative branch side or any oversight side, just to see what life is like and what the constraints are and what the pressures are. Um, I think, you know, looking at the old Hill staffers in the room, I think, and I, I went to the executive branch once, it's amazing, right? How different the, the cultures are and the pressures are and not enough people experience it and go back. So anyone who can help bridge that and let us both speak each other's language, yeah, I, I agree. Could I just jump on this for a second? The FFRDCs were started after World War II when we had a bunch of very talented people who had contributed from anything from the Cincinnati project to whatever. What I found when I was on the government side was they had evolved to look too much like me as a government. Their role had been slowly graduated to have to hire the way that the government hired, to have the oversight, to retain people forever, 
there was supposed to be this turnover. There was supposed to be a broader context of independence. It was supposed to be more like what they had originally stood up. I would encourage a real look at that. Personally, I believe right now I'm on the precip of out dating myself, aging out. I'm four or five years now almost out of the government. And if I don't go in, I should probably retire because I'm not necessarily as relevant and as valuable as I should be. Pontification doesn't help. So you might want to think about what the character of the whole FFRDCs when they were stood up was and see if you're in that image or not. Because that help was and is very, very important to not just the Department of Defense, but the federal government writ large. So I probably won't gain any friends, but. Uh, Dr. Chu. You've all uh, spoken to the issues of budget process with the And so perhaps I could make a comment on specific reforms might be considered for the name too. Uh, I believe this is the 100th anniversary of the object of expenditure accounting system to our the budget is appropriate. Uh, it creates all sorts of issues that you should have funding from the mission or function or outcome as well as input or that's one problem. Maybe impossible given the information we put that. The other is a, a two year or multi year budget of some kind. Try never got off the ground in the 1980s. Uh, but VA, as you know, has for a period of time, no longer, I believe, but for a period of time, enjoyed a two year budget. So right now, rather than for the FY22, it gets revisions for the past system for the healthcare system, healthcare VA. It revisions to FY22, but advanced appropriation for FY22. So that, so that the delay in getting money can be executed is and if circumstances change by the time you get to the next cycle, you can amend the FY22. But at that point, you're also done maybe two possibilities. Change the object of expenditure regime, maybe to a possible future appropriation structure. Second multi year or two year budget, at least maybe to make an adjustment. Um, no, no, I mean, you know, you're, you're asking a lowly authorization staffer these questions. So, <laughs> no, I, I, will, I will say, I think that these are exactly the kinds of things that a commission should chew on and it should balance the needs of all interested parties, right? Like, what does industry need out of this system? What does the executive branch official need out of this system? And what does the congressional uh, staffer need out of this system? And I think you could come to something that gives you what we all want, right? Which is moving dollars to where we want them for what we want at the right time. Um, the fact that some of these systems are 100 years old, right? It should, should lend itself to this idea that, you know, the, the challenge though, is that usually these conversations turn into vilifying someone. <laughs> and saying, why can't they just give us no color, no year money and trust us, right? And so you, you have to talk about it in a different way, but I think those are, those are two great things to discuss. Uh, Mr. Moran, can I, can I make one comment first? I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for the talk you gave here a number of years ago, and I'm riffing partly on Ms. McFarland's comments. Um, the polite interactions between IDA and the government, wherein each side pretends the other is perfect, does not lead to the improvements that at times are needed. <laughs> and when you were here and you gave a talk, you were diplomatic, but pointed enough in your criticism that I remember I felt, because I still had projects with PA&E at the time, I had to defend how I handled myself. IDA needs that from senior government sponsors. We need you to be aware of what we do, and we need to, you to tell us forthrightly when we're not meeting your needs. And I believe your talk was one of a few things that happened in a relatively short period of time that led to a very much reformed uh, and embedded engagement between IDA and, and CAPE, which is still, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, a work in progress. Is that fair, Bob? Um, uh, Christine as well, but she's not here. But anyway, so 
uh, Jamie, thank you very much. I want to sit down now. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad it was helpful. And um, <laughs> speaking of uh, uh, uncomfortable, I wondered if our panel members would talk a little bit about whether you see our system of resource and acquisition control founded on comfortable illusions of control <laughs> rather than real control. We slice and dice our money into tiny matrix of appropriations, fiscal years, activities, and we tie hands and what we've in essence done is created an industry as Air Force Comptroller, commanders wanted O and M money and military personnel. That's right. Buy them for problems. It wasn't sufficient. How much people fuel financial systems using private contractors working under O and M? Right. There's a process of getting a major automated information system. Are we? Ourselves. Yes. And if we recognize that we want to be able Yes. I, I mean, I, I've worked for the Marine Corps for 24 years, and my probably best remembered activity was finding a way to beat the system. And the way I beat the system was multiple ways. One of my favorite was other people's money. Um, if I could get other people's money, as soon as it was in my background, I could use it in whatever color I needed it because it was washed. Later things got a little bit more tight, so I'd have to find other ways. But let me use software as an example for this. If I have R&D money, I will state that I'm having to develop upgrades to the system to match the threat. If I have O&M money, I will say I have to maintain my software against the threat. If I have procurement money, I will say that I have to do the work for multiple end items so that I can procure it. It doesn't match. And it's not the nature to the earlier conversation of priority and import. So if I was to say importance, where the spend is in volume is not necessarily as important as where the spend is to capability, to the C2 analogy. And we don't have any mechanisms for the next Jamie to, to find out what's the true important part. I think there was a comment about the Air Force is using some tools now to try to find out like a rheostat if I spend here what the outcomes are, etc. We need to further those types of tools so that you have visibility into truly what is important and then give the transparency to the Hill so they understand immediately why you need to adjust by having the infiltration of the technology spend and the threat uh, progression so you can be more attuned to it. I'm, I, I certainly agree. I, I, um, the illusion of control, getting back to my point, is when you, one of the things that creates organizational goo is elevating too many things to decision levels where rather than getting smarter, the decision is actually getting dumber in the sense of knowing the details of what's going on. I think we, we confuse the importance of strategic thinking, which is an appropriate way to raise decisions to the people up higher are smarter. Well, they're not smarter. Um, they're super, yes, they are, they're smarter. Um, <laughs> um, but they're gonna have less information, less knowledge. And when, I, when Mr. Work was talking about decision quality information, it's just super hard in an enterprise this big to get decisions of these complicated, nuanced, detailed subjects in a form that it can be handled at that level. And I think that gives the illusion of control again. They, they can't possibly understand all the nuances of what they're deciding because we elevate too many things. Um, if we made better choices about elevating what's strategic, um, I think we could make progress there. Dr. Tate. I'd like to ask a specific concrete example that I suspect reminds the worst features of incentives and organizational yeah. Um, everybody has wanted DOD to use modular open architectures and systems for more than a decade. 
Congress have written laws encouraging them to do so. Uh, the policies have been passed requiring them unless you get a waiver. Uh, and yet we don't. We simply don't do it. It's a very not secure, large, you know, a crusty enterprise uh, modular open architecture that anyone can update or, or contribute to for easy sustainment down the road. What's the fix for that? Right? Why don't we do that? And, and how could we get to a place where we do? What's the fight? <laughs> okay. Sunken costs. I'll say more laws. <laughs> <laughs> so I signed when I was at the ASDA position, waiver after waiver after waiver to the laws that said I was supposed to be open architect in communications. And it was anything from a DNF, uh, um, very important, need to do today, or to financial sunk costs, or to the technology is not there. And we don't have the time or the money to be able to buy the new technology. Um, this issue of make a system open has some policy in it. And when things are constantly pushed in front of you, by operators that are talking about why they're waiving it, I start wondering what the underpinnings are. And the conversations that I've had about open architectures is we have victory, we have, we have all these architectures that are presumably open in the department. When you choose that type of an architecture, you have forecasted your future and innovation is blocked. What you really want to have is the ability when you design to have an understanding of the interface control document or the interface exchange requirements at the engineering level to allow somebody to come in and take a capability out and replace it with a new capability. We don't seem to have the engineering, that area of engineering necessarily right. Well, I think this is an area that FFRDCs can really contribute to by focusing on the objective outcome, which is allowing for components and elements within a system to be able to be upgraded and changed out appropriate to the threat. There's a lot of thought that goes into that. I think one thing that would help where we work is if someone could, could get a sounding from defense industry to see what kind of reforms and what structure of programs they would actually support that makes some business case to them. So that a single company doesn't feel like the way forward here is for me to control all of, let's say, GADC2 or something like that. That it really makes business sense for me to be part of this open system. And then that, we then hearing it from that set of constituents gives us something more concrete to push on. I don't. I've never heard that from their side. And it gets into these issues of what kind of tech data you have, what kind of interface controls do you have, what do you even understand about the system you're buying, and you know, when, when does your contractor let you understand these things? Um, but I think that's the missing element. I, we, we get a set of voices from the executive branch side, we get a very different set of voices from the defense industry. Uh, Bob? First, I want to make a comment because there's a story to it. Apparently, there's nothing to do with actually having the system open. So, I actually kind of see the measure. That's the Constitution. Over a decade ago, it cost 50% more than an entire new idea. So, there's something wrong there. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. A few questions. That's not where we have a problem. The problem is we have thought process sometimes. We have a for example, programs are just part of our playing a winning game against the adversary. Never no capability. All the programs are just collapsed. So 
Okay, I'm going to just talk to the you know, to say, well, if you do that, and you can stay with the way it's going to be. Then just have an engineering conference. So, getting it right up front is really the important thing. How do you solve it? That's not something you can change. You will actually get better speed if you get it right up front. Let me let me jump in for a second because uh, I, I don't think the people online could hear the question. But the, the summary line at the end, getting it right up front, is a critical issue. Uh, it's partly requirements, it's partly other things as well. It's partly th the the threat changing, the, th the threat forecast. But getting it right up, the two points I think were that number one, getting it right up front is important, and number two, if you do get it right up front, you will get the speed as a byproduct. So I was the speed guy, so I um, I, I agree. I, there's no contradiction between getting it right up front and doing the speed things I talked about. I, I do want to talk about differentiation again, that the amount of effort and the amount of horsepower you put on getting it right for an aircraft carrier or a bomber is different. And then even within a system, um, Hondo Gertz had a great quote about submarines. He said, we need to treat the wet parts and the dry parts differently. And, and what he meant was that the, the wet parts, we're going to own a really long time. And it's a point Ar Arun has made. We talk about how long it takes to acquire something. The real differentiator is how long we're going to own it. So we're going to have these submarines a really long time. The, the Do we have it right question is different for that than for some of the systems within it that are going to change constantly. So it, it comes down to differentiation again, which isn't an easy out. That's a hard out. It, it means we have to think all the time about it in individual cases and the processes themselves. But I, um, I'm a cost guy, right? That, that's a fundamental part of getting it right, right? And, and I believe in that. Um, but how you do it should depend on the system you're talking about and what the risks are. I mentioned this a little bit. And, and I, you know, from a legislative branch perspective, the processes that you're talking about are, are it's opaque to us. We, we don't see them. Now, on the other hand, if someone could teach us, what signatures we should be looking for for that program that's going to inevitably fail. Happily, we will start looking for those things. But our only recourse, as far as I can conceive, is to designate some important person at OSD to look over the shoulder of the services and check on whatever it is, TRL 6 at milestone B, something important prior to milestone A. Did you did you do the appropriate business process re-engineering before you spent money on the business system? Not sure what we as an outside group can do to get that deep into the process. And then, you know, if I then turn it over to OSD in all of those different forms, I guess I have to resign myself to given the way we use data and technology. It's, Going to create this horrible bureaucratic risk aversion process, right? And so that's what we're all hoping for is that what you're addressing the issues you're talking about in a much more streamlined and rational way. So I guess I'll wrap up with that question and say one of the most important things that I had was the availability of time to do that thing called thinking, whether I was a GS7 or an SES or in a political position. And I am really very much interested in furthering the analytical capacities that could help people improve their decision making. And I really hope, and I'm working to help that hope become reality, that we start adopting and adapting those tools to help us be informed as we make these types of decisions. And with that, we can, uh, we can go to break. <laughs>